This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. On the evening before his death, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered one of the most stirring and prophetic speeches of his life. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. Less than 24 hours after he spoke those words, Martin Luther King was assassinated. His accused killer, James Earl Ray, pled guilty to the murder, and the case was officially closed. This Sunday marks the 25th anniversary of Dr. King's death. It is a milestone that has focused renewed attention on the circumstances surrounding the investigation of James Earl Ray. Just three days after his conviction, Ray recanted his guilty plea, alleging that he was but a pawn in a wide-ranging conspiracy to kill King. Ray's claims of innocence, however, were dismissed, and the case remained closed. In 1976, eight years after King's death, a select committee of the U.S. House of Representatives was impaneled to reinvestigate the assassinations of King and President John F. Kennedy. The committee concluded that James Earl Ray was the lone assassin of Dr. King. It is a conclusion, however, that Walter Fauntroy, the chairman of the King subcommittee, now believes was wrong. When you look at a murder, you look at three things. Uh, who had the motive, the means, and the opportunity. I'm not now satisfied that James Earl Ray had a sufficient motive, that he had the means, and certainly the opportunity to pull it off as it was done. I also thought I could establish that I was at a service station during the time that uh, Martin Luther King was shot. To this day, James Earl Ray maintains that he did not shoot Martin Luther King. But the FBI stands by their original finding. Ray was the lone gunman. Now some researchers claim that new information corroborates Ray's allegations of conspiracy. Based in part on that new information, Walter Fauntroy is calling for a new investigation and for the immediate public release of the committee's files, currently sealed until the year 2029. Tonight, we will examine both sides of this complex and controversial case. Join me for this special presentation and more on Unsolved Mysteries. organizations, grassroots organizations uh, should make it Martin clear. Luther King arrived in Memphis on April 3rd, 1968, the day before he was assassinated. King checked into the Lorraine Motel and began planning a march in support of striking city sanitation workers. King's presence at the motel had been well publicized by the press. Across the street from the motel was a series of rundown buildings, which included a rooming house run by a woman named Bessie Brewer. On April 4th, shortly before 6 p.m., William Anschutz, a tenant of the rooming house, found the building's communal bathroom locked. What you are about to see is the official government account of the assassination of Martin Luther King. Inside the bathroom, James Earl Ray, a career petty criminal, loaded a high-powered rifle and took aim at room 306 of the Lorraine Motel. King stepped out of that room to go to dinner. A single deadly shot rang out. The bullet struck King in the face,
throwing him violently backward onto the balcony. Several friends rushed to his aid. His wounds, however, were severe and irreparable. According to the government, as King lay dying, James Earl Ray raced into the room he had rented earlier that day. He wrapped the rifle along with an overnight bag containing personal items in a bedspread. In the hallway, Ray was seen by Charles Quitman Stevens, who lived in the room adjacent to the bathroom. Mere seconds from a clean getaway, the government believes Ray saw a police car and panicked, dropping his bundle in the doorway of the Knipe Amusement Company. Looked like somebody dropped something. A moment later, three witnesses inside the building saw a white car, possibly a Mustang, speed away. Police recovered the rifle along with Ray's effects, but by the time they identified Ray, he had fled the country. Two months later, Ray was apprehended by British authorities at London's Heathrow Airport as he attempted to board a flight to Brussels. On March 10, 1969, in Memphis, Tennessee, James Earl Ray pled guilty to the murder of Martin Luther King. Ray was sentenced to 99 years in the state penitentiary. Three days after his conviction, however, Ray fired his attorney and claimed he had been pressured into pleading guilty. Ray denied shooting King and, incredibly, alleged that he himself was a victim of an intricate conspiracy which used him as a hapless scapegoat for the assassination. Over the years, Ray's claim has found many supporters who argue that the possibility of a conspiracy was never adequately investigated by either state officials or the FBI. James Earl Ray spent most of his adult life in and out of prison. Though extensive, his criminal career was comprised almost exclusively of small-time holdups and robberies, none of which involved violence. Indeed, to many, Ray seemed an unlikely candidate for such a notorious crime. I find it more difficult uh, today than I found it at the time when we closed down the investigation to believe that James Earl Ray, acting alone, uh, pulled off the crime of the century, uh, was able to get out of Memphis, out of the country into Canada, to get three passports and to go all the way to Europe uh, without help. On April 23, 1967, almost a year before King was assassinated, James Earl Ray escaped from the state penitentiary in Jefferson City, Missouri, where he was serving a 20-year sentence for robbing a grocery store. For some, Ray's subsequent movements and activities are strong evidence of a conspiracy. Ray initially fled to Chicago, and then in mid-July to Montreal, using the name Eric Starvo Galt, he discreetly solicited the criminal underground for a phony passport or seaman's papers. I hear you're looking for something. According to Ray, yeah. he was eventually approached by a shadowy character who used only the name Raoul. How hard would it be to get Canadian seaman's papers? Ray claims that almost nine months later, it was Raoul who set him up as the fall guy for the King assassination. Some cash? But when they first met, Ray says Raoul was only looking for an accomplice in a smuggling scheme. A few deliveries. How many? Ray claimed that in exchange for Ray's agreeing to perform certain uh, tasks, evidently of a criminal nature, one, he was provided with money, and two, he was promised that at some point he would be given identification, a passport, something he needed to get out of the country. Where will these deliveries be? Ray alleges that his first job with Raoul involved smuggling unknown contraband across the U.S.-Canadian border near Detroit, for which Ray was paid $750. Ray claims he was then directed by Raoul to go to Birmingham, Alabama. Ray has detailed his travels to his current attorney, William Pepper. Ironically, Pepper had once been an associate of Dr. King's. In 1978, Pepper was persuaded by one of King's closest friends, Ralph Abernathy, to meet with Ray. Pepper is now convinced that Ray's story is true and that Raoul is the key to the conspiracy. Well, what Raoul did from that point on was to uh, keep James on a string, have him 
in various points and places, pay him bits of money, have him do various things, and really pretty much keep him on a string so that he was available, as it turns out, for use any time that they wanted to use him, always with the promise of these travel documents. When's the last time you changed the brake pad? Three months ago. I got over 20,000 on the first set. Ray says it in Birmingham. Raul gave him $2,000 and told him to purchase a car. 17. On August 30th, 1967, seven months before the assassination, Ray did, in fact, buy a white 1966 Mustang. All right, 2,000 is. You got yourself one hell of a car. Ray says he then drove to Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, where he and Raul engaged in another smuggling venture. A month later, Ray traveled to Los Angeles to await further instructions. In mid-March, less than three weeks before the assassination, Raul told Ray to leave for Atlanta. There, on March 29th, just five days before the assassination, Raul outlined their next criminal enterprise. I'm going to need you to buy a gun. What for? I have a new client. He wants to purchase some rifles. 200. I can't buy 200 weapons. You only need one. Right now, he just wants to see a sample. What kind of rifle? Next bit of activity they were going to be involved in had to do with selling guns. And the scenario that he developed was one which involved the, the, the purchase of uh, sort of sample weapons and that he, Raul, would show to these gun runners. And uh, once they then uh, made a selection or made a choice, so the story went, uh, they would be bought in volume. Ray alleges that later that day, he and Raul drove to Birmingham Following Raul's instructions, Ray went to a gun shop where he purchased a 243 yeah. caliber rifle, which he had fitted with a okay. telescopic sight. Not sure, but I'm going deer hunting with my brother. The evidence is, is that uh, from the people who witnessed his purchase of the rifle in, the, uh, in Birmingham, is that he didn't know the first thing about rifles. He was confused about what he wanted, didn't know what he wanted, got the wrong, bought the wrong rifle. Uh, so he didn't have the kind of familiarity with firearms that you would expect of somebody who was going to murder someone. This isn't going to work. Why? The caliber's too small. He said it was a good deer rifle. It's not suitable for our purposes. I was wondering if I could exchange it. Why is that? Is there something wrong with this one? Ray says Raul told him to exchange the weapon the next day, giving him specific instructions on what to buy. Uh, Remington model, 760 Game Master, pump action. Ray claims he gave the Remington Game Master rifle to Raul at the New Rebel Motel in Memphis on April 3rd, the day before the assassination. This will do fine. So, uh, when will you need another 200? I'm not sure. After my crimes. According to James Earl Ray, that was the last time he saw the rifle. The official investigation concluded that it was used to kill Martin Luther King the next day. At 3.30 p.m. on the day of Martin Luther King's assassination, James Earl Ray claims he met his mysterious contact, Raul, at Jim's Grill, a local Sorry, coffee shop. I'm going to need a room to meet with my client. Where? Ray says Raul told him to go to Bessie Brewer's rooming house upstairs. Okay. He wanted Ray to rent a room then await instructions. Bessie Brewers fronted Main Street next to the Knipe Amusement Company, where the rifle would later be found. The back windows of Bessie's, however, where the communal bathroom was located, faced Mulberry Street and the Lorraine Motel. How long are you staying? I don't know. A couple of nights, maybe. At 4 p.m., Ray rented a room using the alias John Willard. Raul had instructed Ray to bring along an overnight bag for appearances' sake. Ray says Raul also told him to leave the Mustang parked nearby because Raul wanted to use it that night. Yeah, I'll take it. Pay in advance. The next hour is pure speculation. Ray himself has changed his story several times, but he has always maintained that he left the boarding house at around 5 p.m. and never returned. 
Ray says that just before 6, he drove the Mustang to a local service station. At 6.01 p.m., Martin Luther King was shot. Right now, leaking one of my back tires. You got a minute to take a look at it? Not right now. We're off a visit. Could you come back in a couple of hours? All right, thanks. Ray claims that at the very moment King was shot, he himself was totally unaware of the event and was driving from the gas station back to the rooming house. And as he got to the corner of Calhoun in South Maine, uh, he saw already that there were police barricades and policemen everywhere. Well, the state makes a great deal of the fact that James fled the scene, you know. And they, uh, but James was, one must remember, a fugitive. He was on the run, and he was certainly not going to hang around wherever he saw police. So he turned left, went uh, headed in the opposite direction, and uh, began to make his way out of Memphis. Was it James Earl Ray who targeted room 306 at the Lorraine Motel from the window of Bessie Brewer's rooming house? For many skeptics, Ray's apparent lack of expertise with firearms seems to argue against the official account. In the Army, he was trained with an M1, uh, and he was at the lowest level of ability. The idea of loading by hand a single shot into uh, that 30 6 and uh, gambling everything on that one shot makes no sense whatsoever. You have to bear in mind that from the window of the rooming house to the balcony where Dr. King was killed was less than 100 yards. With a telescopic sight at such a short distance, almost anyone in the world could have killed Dr. King. It, it really required no great marksmanship whatsoever. Many people have come to believe that the shot which killed Martin Luther King came not from the boarding house window, but instead from the bushy abutment between the boarding house and the motel. It's now clear to me that the shot is likely to have come from the ground below, where at least two persons personally known to me reported that, uh, at least to me, that they thought the shot came from someone in the bushes below. Two eyewitnesses, one of them Dr. King's driver, do say they saw someone dressed in white running from the bushes just after the shooting. We never were sure that there was a man in the bushes. And if there was a man in the bushes, we think he had absolutely nothing to do with the murder. Uh, we, we, were, we were then, and I still am, totally convinced that the fatal shot came from the window of the rooming house. The official version states that Ray ran from Bessie Brewers, observed by another tenant, Charles Stevens. However, there are serious doubts about Stevens' credibility. From all accounts, uh, Stevens was uh, so dead drunk that uh, there's no way of relying upon uh, his testimony about the uh, shot. In fact, we did not rely on him for an eyewitness identification. What we did rely on him for was having sufficient senses to be aware of a loud noise uh, down the hall and in the bathroom and to open the door and see somebody run by. What you have to realize about uh, Charlie Stevens is that he was looking for a reward. He was trying to get the $100,000 reward that had been put up for uh, anyone who could identify uh, the slayer of Dr. King. So that became a, very much a business for him and it became very much uh, his concern to try to uh, uh, be credible. In his flight from the rooming house, Ray purportedly ran by the Knipe Amusement Company, dropping his weapon in a panic. But a former defense investigator believes it highly improbable that any killer, no matter how panicked, would drop a bundle of evidence so thoroughly incriminating. He didn't have to take all that junk with him. He didn't even have to take the rifle with him. Even if he'd used the rifle, all he had to do was get out. It strikes many people, myself included, that that looks like a setup, that somebody else gathered that evidence up and planted it there. A dusting of the rooming house turned up a number of fingerprints which were never identified, but the investigation failed to turn up even a single print belonging to James Earl Ray. That's not really strange. Uh, I've worked any number of cases where, where you don't find fingerprints when you think you should. Uh, you may find a lot of smudges and smears, but you won't find a fingerprint that's, that in itself is, is complete enough to make a positive identification. 
The abandoned gun was void of fingerprints, except for two of James Earl Ray's. As part of the investigation, the FBI swab tested the rifle Ray had returned to determine whether or not it had been fired. However, they never conducted a swab test on the gun they believed to be the murder weapon. My recollection is that it had a spent shell that was in the chamber. So common sense would tell you that someone had fired that rifle. The FBI could not match the bullet which killed King with the rifle. They could say only that the bullet was consistent with that type of rifle. The fact that the bullet markings are said to have been consistent with having been from the, the rifle means absolutely nothing. It was also consistent with several million other rifles of the same kind. Ray bought the rifle. Uh, the rifle was used to shoot King. Uh, he fled the scene. His fingerprints are on it. His explanations for an alibi, his flight, uh, all don't hold water. Even for those who believe Ray's story, there remains a nagging question. If indeed James Earl Ray is innocent, why did he plead guilty? I just am not going to discuss it. Ray claims it's that he was coerced by his attorney, who wanted exclusive publishing rights to Ray's story. If Ray had testified in court, his allegations of conspiracy would have become public domain. This will do fine. The crucial element of Ray's story was the elusive Raoul, the man Ray said had moved him like a puppet all over the United States. Where do you want me to be next? In our investigation to identify Ray and to find out what he did and where and when, we turned up nothing to indicate that there was either a Raoul or any other conspirator involved in this crime. In 1975, former defense investigator Harold Weisberg filed a lawsuit against the FBI. He received 60,000 pages of documents on the King assassination. Three years later, Weisberg found evidence in the files that Ray had been involved with a man named J.C. Harden. Weisberg believes that evidence is proof of a conspiracy. When I was going through the files of the Los Angeles FBI office, I found where a man who used the name of J.C. Harden had called Jimmy from Atlanta. Yeah, he's here around 3.13, but he's out. I saw him go out about an hour ago. Ask him to call James C. Harden. H-A-R-D-I-N. When Jimmy didn't return the call, so far as we know, Harden then went out to California, and he met with Jimmy. This is con this confirmed story in the FBI's records. Is it possible that J.C. Harden, the man who visited James Earl Ray three weeks before the assassination, was, in fact, Raoul? At the very least, the timing of the visit appears to be more than simple coincidence. It is a live lead. The one thing you have to question, given the history of this whole thing, Harden goes to California, Jimmy goes east, Jimmy goes east on the trip in which Dr. King gets killed. Now, it's not like pushing buttons, but it's the next thing to it. And that should have been investigated. In 1968, the FBI pursued the lead long enough to create this sketch of J.C. Harden based on a description given by the manager of the St. Francis Hotel. However, as soon as James Earl Ray was arrested, the Harden investigation was dropped. We knew nothing about Harden. I'd like to find Mr. Harden, and uh, I'd like further to interrogate Mr. Ray, because I don't think he is telling us everything that, that he knows uh, that uh, may, uh, uh, may lead us to uh, a different conclusion than that which we've reached, uh, that which we reached back in 1978. Do you think you've got James Earl Ray has refused to say whether J.C. Harden and Raoul are one and the same. In addition, he has been unwilling to make a positive identification of Raoul. I don't have any reason to believe that Harden could be Raoul because I don't really have any reason to believe that Raoul is Raoul. I'm not convinced that there is anybody named Raoul involved in this case. There is no way that James Earl Ray is a lone assassin. James Earl Ray is the classic patsy. 
Martin King was, uh, was killed as a result of a, a conspiracy. We do not know the whole truth about this. We need to know it in the decade of the 90s when we've got a new generation of leadership on the scene that we don't want to meet the same fate that uh, Martin, Malcolm, Bobby, and John met. Will we ever know? The answer is no. We won't know because the FBI in 1968 didn't conduct an adequate conspiracy investigation. They conducted a shooter investigation and then stopped. I've seen the promised land. And that's one of the tragedies in Dr. King's death. He did not get in his death an investigation commencement with the dignity of his life. Had he gotten it, uh, many of the unanswered questions about his death uh, would have answers to that. In 1943, the outcome of World War II hung in the balance as U.S. and Allied forces launched an all-out assault on the German and Italian strongholds in North Africa. After months of fierce combat and thousands of Allied casualties, enemy resistance finally collapsed. But during the summer and fall, sporadic fighting continued to claim American lives. One of those killed in action was Army Private Harry A. Young from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He left behind a wife and two sons. 37 years later, Harry Young would become the focal point of an unsolved mystery when his son and granddaughter came across his obituary while researching their family history. The information in the death notice seemed all wrong, as if it had been written for a completely different man. He was survived by a three-month-old daughter, Kathleen. When I found a notice, then I realized that it wasn't written right. Mother's first name was right and everything, but the address and the fact that there was a baby girl mentioned and me or my brother was not mentioned. Well, at first I thought that the, uh, the paper made a mistake, which wasn't common, you know, papers do make mistakes. And uh, I thought maybe that they had got the information wrong and uh, I had a copy made so I could go into it further. Imagine reading your father's obituary and stumbling upon a dark family secret which had been kept hushed for more than 37 years. Albert Young was suddenly confronted with two puzzling questions. Why had he and his brother Jimmy not been listed as survivors? Was a three-month-old girl named in the notice a sister they never knew existed? Albert Young's search for answers took him back to the early days of the Second World War. Following the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, Harry Young and millions of other Americans rushed to enlist in the service. I can't stay here while there's a war going on. I need you to sign this paper. But Harry had already served six years in the Marine Corps, and at age 30, with a family to support, he was required to get his wife Laura's permission to re-enlist. Six years, I'd like to have a little help. Look, two years, I'll be back. Just sign the paper. No. Laura adamantly refused. Laura! Harry Young walked out that day, never to return. He had no idea that Laura was pregnant with her second child. Four months later, using forged documents, Harry enlisted in the army and was sent overseas to fight in the African campaign. Only then did he inform Laura of what he had done. Mrs. Young? This yes. is from the War Department. On October 24, 1943, Laura Young received the news every soldier's wife fears. Her husband, Harry, was dead. A short time later, 
the local office of the Veterans Administration uncovered a serious problem. According to their records, Harry Young was survived by two wives. Mrs. Young, there seems to be a problem. We have another Laura Young who has already filed for Harry's death benefits. But I'm Harry's wife. Well, that may be, ma'am. Do you have a daughter? No, I have two sons. Do you live on Fayette Street in Conshohocken? No, I've always lived in Philadelphia. Well, this certainly does pose a problem. From what I have found out, there were two women collecting benefits for one man. And that's when it had to be proven that my grandmother was indeed the first wife and was never divorced from my grandfather. This means a lot to me, though. I know. Apparently, after leaving Laura, Harry Young began living with another woman named Estella in a town just 10 miles away. After Harry's death, Estella filed for benefits using Laura's name. It's your wife, right? As far as I'm concerned, you are my wife. Well, do you know who this woman is who claims to be Laura Young on Fayette Street in Conshohocken? No, I do not. But what I do know is that I am Laura Young and I was married to Harry. Mrs. Young, we're going to need a marriage certificate or some documentation to substantiate your claim. I have one right here. After a lengthy and humiliating battle with the Veterans Administration, Laura Young was finally able to prove that she was Harry's lawful wife. She retained all benefits for herself and her two sons, Albert and Jimmy. Well, this certainly will help. For nearly 40 years, the details of Harry and Estella's love affair were kept secret from his sons. <laughs> then in 1992, an intriguing letter surfaced. It had been written by Estella and sent to Harry's parents the day after she learned of Harry's death. Dear Mother and Dad Young, this is a very hard letter for me to write. I guess I'd better explain myself to you. I know that Harry would want it that way. I knew he was married and that we couldn't be, so we lived together as man and wife. He was happy with me, and we really loved each other very deeply. We have a three-month-old baby girl. She was born July 29th. It's OK, sweetie. We named her Kathleen Mary Young. I loved him more than life itself and still believe that he will come back to me someday. When I read the letter, I got the feeling that she was very much in love with my grandfather, that she was devoted to him, and she would do anything in the world for him. After receiving no reply to her letter, Estella paid a surprise visit to Harry's parents. Hello, oh, Mr. Young. I'm Estella. This is Kathleen Mary. Pleased to meet you. We got your letter, and, uh, well, my wife and I agree that what you did was wrong. Mr. Young, Harry and I loved each other very, very much. I just thought that you'd like to meet your granddaughter. Maybe she well, had had dreams nothing. that after he came home from Why work, they could work things out or, you know, who knows what was I in have her some mind. Of things. Would you like me to bring them over to you? No. Just send them. As far as anyone knows, that was the last time Estella and her daughter Kathleen Mary had any contact with Harry's family. I think it's something that's really important for my father and my uncle to know their sister. Uh, over the years, I've seen what the secrets that the family kept from them has done to, the, to them, and they need to know who their sister is and share their life with her. My own feelings are that out know, of this whole mess, there's no real winners. Uh, where there's a lot of time lost. Uh, we, there was a lot of, lot of time lost between uh, family, really. And I'd like to talk to her, you know, and see uh, how she's doing and if she got married, if she has children, you know, and, and 
and let her know that there's a family out here, you know, that uh, cares for her. Kathleen Mary Young grew up knowing next to nothing about her two half-brothers, Albert and Jim, until the night of our broadcast. That evening, Kathleen couldn't have been more surprised when she heard her name on television. By the next morning, she had talked to both Albert and Jim. Kathleen had heard that Harry's parents rejected her mother, and she knew about one of her brothers, but she never imagined that anyone was looking for her. It makes me feel, I don't know, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel like special in a way that they took the time in all those years that now that I know that they were looking for me. On September 19, 1993, the long separation came to an end when Kathleen Young, accompanied by her family, came to Stratford, New Jersey to meet her half-brothers for the first time. When I hugged her, it was euphoria. Uh, it, it felt wonderful. I knew it was her as soon as she stepped out of the car. It, it, that, that's, that's a young. For the three children of Harry Young, the reunion meant a new beginning. After 50 years apart, they were finally a family. Thank you. It's nice to meet you both. When we return, authorities need your help to capture an accused killer on the run for 14 years. Bryan, Texas is a type of place that people have in mind when they dream of escaping the big city. But in September of 1984, the illusion of small town security was shattered for one local couple, whom we will call Sue and Bill. Love you. Love you too. Bye. I'll call you Chad. Okay. Sue had always considered herself strong and self-reliant. However, the events of September 6th would test her character in ways she never imagined. Well, it started like any other morning. My husband was leaving for work. My three-year-old was up front watching Sesame Street. My husband left and I went back into the bathroom in the master bedroom to finish getting dressed. I was standing there looking in the mirror, finishing up my hair, and I picked up the makeup mirror. And I looked, and he had a large hunting knife. Fearing for the safety of her child, Sue instinctively attacked. She forced the intruder from the bathroom and then drove him out of the house at gunpoint. He was getting in the truck at the time, and I do remember hitting metal, but I don't think I hit him. It was very quick, and I don't think he was expecting me to do that. I think he probably was expecting me to plead with him not to do anything, and I reversed the situation on him. Well, after that, the police came out and took the report and all that, and we went downtown to see, go through the mug book and all that, and I never, we went through page after page and never saw anything that resembled him. Alan B. Bryan again, 35 is zip. Four months passed without further clues to the man's identity. Sue had assumed he was simply a first-time burglar. She couldn't have been more wrong. I was going through the newspaper, and I opened it up, and his picture, was in the newspaper. That's the guy. What? That's the guy. Honey, this is the guy that tried to kill me. And I was just shocked to have found out what he had done. That's him right there. In January of 1985, the Texas governor's office released a roster of the state's most wanted criminals. Heading the list was a knife-wielding intruder. His name was Edward Harold Bell, and he was wanted for murder. Edward Bell's long criminal record stretched back to 1969 and included aggravated rape and numerous counts of indecent exposure to children. Bell is a formidable fugitive, a graduate of Texas A&M University and once a successful businessman. He has eluded capture for almost 16 years. He has yet to stand trial for the shocking murder that took place August 24, 1978. 
That summer, 26-year-old Larry Dickens was visiting his mother and sister in Pasadena, Texas, a suburb of Houston. An ex-Marine and youth counselor, Larry was the father of a three-year-old girl. My son, Larry, he was home for a few days, and he was cutting our lawn for us. I was standing at the kitchen window, and there were a lot of children playing in the intersection right by our house. We live on a corner, and I saw this pickup truck drive up. He parked, and he was looking all around, and he was fooling with something in the seat. I thought this must be one of Larry's friends looking for our address. He got out of his truck, and he was nude from his waist down, and he started walking toward the children. Get me the Pasadena police real quick, please. Uh, yes, you, you've got a, a guy out here at the corner of Moore and Apple, and he's exposing oh. himself. Oh, what, wrong? honey? Honey, look at that man out there. Look what he is doing, Larry. No. What you are about to see is a mother's he's, worst nightmare. Oh God. Every no, horrible detail is Pick true. Oh, oh, my son has gone out there. He's taking the keys. He's trying to detain him. Oh, the guy's come back. No, he's, he's putting his pants on now. I don't know. I hear them arguing. I don't know what they're saying. Oh, my God, he's got a gun. Oh, God, he's got a gun. I, I don't know. It, it's a little gun. I think it's a cap gun. Not getting your keys. He just shot it in the air. He's shooting Larry. It's not a cap gun. I see blood. He's shooting Larry. Larry. Please don't shoot him. And the man just shot him anyway. And then he turned and started running out of our garage. And Larry, even with all those bullets in him, was still trying to stop this man. Larry had been shot four times in the chest and once in the head with a 22 pistol. Just be something. And I said, Larry, lay very still because you don't know where those bullets are. And I'll run in there and call an ambulance. But I said, whatever you do, don't move. <laughs> when Larry's mother came back to the phone, the emergency operator was still on the line. She told Larry's mother that police units and an ambulance were on the way. Give me an ambulance. Oh, oh God, he's got a rifle. He's got, he's got. <laughs> At just that moment, Larry's 17-year-old sister, Donna, was returning home from cheerleader practice. I pulled up to the stop sign, and I saw a man cross the street to the edge of my driveway. He saw me. We made eye contact. And I looked, and I got a good close look at the man and I tried to block his exit. I pulled up beside his truck and I realized he had just shot my brother. Larry! Oh, oh my God. Donna! Donna! I said, Mom, is he dead? Is he dead? And she said, I don't know, Donna, I think so. And I remember I just started screaming. And I just screamed and screamed. And then when I couldn't scream anymore, I remember I just went over and I knelt down beside my brother and I held his hand to my face and I watched him die. The suspect is dispatcher radioed the suspect's description as police units headed to the scene. 
At that very instant, the officers recognized the suspect's truck. Edward Bell might have claimed a second victim that afternoon, but his M1 rifle suddenly jammed. Freeze! Put your hands up! Don't move! Drop the gun! Drop it! Back away! Back away from it! Easy. Within 20 minutes of the murder, Bell was in the hands of the police and on his way to face Larry's mother and sister. Okay, Ms. Lang, I need for you to identify the suspect that you're calling back. I can't. I'm sorry. I can't. I'll do it. I'll I do it, Mama. Can't. I'll do okay, it. I'm okay. sorry. Sure, come on. I just couldn't. It's I can't. It's all right. It's all right. They opened the back door of the police car so that I could see yeah, him better. Yeah, that's him! I hate you! I hate you! Why did you kill my brother? I just wanted to get my hands on him. I hate you! It hurts me so bad that he killed my brother. It's just broken up the whole family. There's always going to be an emptiness, a part that's never going to be reunited. I mean, part of me is missing. Edward Bell was released on bail less than two months after the murder. He quietly liquidated his assets and with more than $140,000 in his pocket, disappeared. Bell has been seen only once since then, when he entered the home in Bryan, Texas in September of 1984. Everywhere I go, I see this man. I go to the grocery store and he's there. Of course, it's not him, but it looks just like him to me. I live in fear that this guy is going to come back or fear that he's going to hurt someone else. Our family has missed Larry so much. He was strong, and he was so special to all of us. It just doesn't seem right that this man can be back on the streets exposing himself to children and doing God knows what else when, when Larry has been dead all these years and he's still at large. He's not leaving a paper trail. That tells me that probably he's changed his name and he's living somewhere where someone doesn't know how dangerous he is. For almost 15 years, Edward Bell eluded detection until December 2nd, 1992, the night of our broadcast. One of our viewers was stunned to realize that a man he had recently conducted business with in Panama City, Panama, was none other than the fugitive killer, Edward Harold Bell. A second viewer, who remains anonymous, sent these pictures in a letter claiming that Bell had been living in Panama for 10 years. Among other business activities, Bell was prospecting for gold on land he owned near Panama City. The Panama police were able to locate Mr. Bell, at which time they placed him under arrest, and uh, the FBI, along with the Panama City Police Department, then brought Mr. Bell back to the United States. Finally, a decade and a half after Dorothy Lang's son had been gunned down before her eyes, the accused killer shuffled past her, shackled in hand and leg cuffs. When he got off the airplane, he seemed so arrogant, and it, it just infuriated me. Here they're bringing this murderer back, 
and they could never bring back my son. And just the grief welled up in me again. The wounds will never heal. The hurt will always be there that I've lost my brother. But at least justice will be done, and I think we'll all be able to go on with our lives. At Bell's trial, the prosecution's chief witnesses will be Larry's sister and mother. I feel that I can face this man in court and, and say, we finally got you in custody, and I hope they throw the book at you because you deserve it. That's the way I'll feel about it. In 1947, Hollywood's post-war euphoria was shattered by the brutal murder of a young woman known as the Black Dahlia. Nearly a half century later, there is evidence that the same killer was the personal nemesis of legendary lawman Elliot Ness. In Pennsylvania, a brave teenage girl cared for her five brothers and sisters through a harsh winter, only to see them taken away one by one. Perhaps you can help end her long search. Join me next time for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Thank you.